good. All right, for our last lightning round session for today's Big Talk from Small Libraries conference, um, we have Mark Ross, who is, um, well, he's got multiple <laughs> head of the Hanley and Haskell libraries, two different libraries through the University of Pittsburgh, two of their smaller campuses, um, FTT, uh, FTE about 1300. Yeah, round about. <laughs> but we're about between them, so a small section of the University of Pittsburgh. And he is going to talk to us about he's dealt with his small staff with big personalities and conflicts that may arise. So go ahead and take it away, Mark. Thank you so much. Yes, my name is Mark Ross. I am going to talk today in my lightning presentation, um, small staff, big personalities. Um, I did change one word in my subtitle to recognizing and managing conflict in small libraries. Um, as I was doing my practice runs this week, um, I realized that a lot of the conflict and a lot of the uh, things that I may, um, that came about in my libraries um, were due to me not recognizing things or other staff people not recognizing um, themselves um, as they were working. So I added that word recognizing into the title because I think that's really important. Um, as uh, I'm sure all of us are aware, at small libraries, small regional campuses, small branch campuses of colleges and universities, and in public libraries, we all wear many hats. Um, I, I have two libraries under me. I wanted to give a brief introduction about myself. I'm the head of the Haskell Memorial Library. That's at the University of Pittsburgh, Titusville. Here, I'm the IT person. I'm the building manager. I do, I'm the sole instruction librarian. I'm the sole collection development librarian. On top of all that, all my committee work and all the um, departments that I help um, throughout the campus, um, I do that. Um, I've been here at Titusville for about eight years. Um, in July of 2021, I took on the role of the head of the Hanley Library at the University of Pittsburgh, Bradford. Um, because I'm mostly remote in that position, I'm more of an administrative role, a sounding board for faculty librarians to bounce ideas off of, um, a sounding board for staff members to bounce ideas off of, and I'm trying to become a better mentor for my um, staff and librarians. So um, there's a real balancing act between all those roles and being a good leader, um, and that's what I'm gonna attempt to do, and I'll discuss a little bit um, in my presentation. So a little bit more about my campuses and my libraries, just so you get a sense of just how small we are and how the staff might uh, work. Titusville is the smallest Pitt campus. We're a two year degree granting um, institution. Pre 2020, we usually floated around 350 students. Now we have about 42, that's a huge drop. Um, it's not because of COVID, it's because we've moved away from a traditional liberal arts two year uh, degree program to one that focuses more on career and technical education. Um, along with that, um, we have had some staffing changes pre-COVID. There was one full-time librarian, which is me, and two full-time staff people, one daylight staff person, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then one evening and weekend staff person, usually 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, Post-COVID, um, one full-time librarian, me, and one full-time staff. Both of my staff, um, pre-COVID and throughout the COVID um, took on other roles. Um, so whenever we reopened, I was able to get one full-time staff person back. <clears throat> Bradford, um, it's a small campus in North Central PA. They do offer four-year uh, bachelor degree programs. Usually floats between uh, 1,200 and 1,300 students. Uh, Pre-COVID, there was three full-time staff, uh, three full-time librarians and four full-time staff members. Post-COVID, when we reopened fully for more normalcy in the fall of 2021, we started with just two full-time librarians and two full-time staff. So we only had four, four people to cover about 70 hours a week um, with me being uh, 50 miles away in a remote um, position. Um, we were able to hire on a, th a third full-time librarian, but we have not been able to hire on the full two full-time staff. So currently between my Titusville and Bradford team, we have four librarians and three staff. So seven uh, team members across the two libraries. <clears throat> I wanted to start with um, a brief case study about a conflict that came up at uh, the, my Titusville library. This was right before COVID. Um, so probably in 2019, fall of 2019, if I'm remembering uh, my dates right, um, and I'll fully admit, and I have it as the last bullet point, um, 
I think it's really important for leaders and managers to admit whenever they make mistakes and learn from them. Most of it arose from a failure of leadership. So I had uh, two full-time staff members at the time, uh, one evening person and one daylight person. I assumed because there was the evening and weekend person that she would want to take on a role of doing some fun programming for the students. Um, there's not a lot to do in Titusville, um, especially on evenings and weekends. So we wanted to open up the library on um, for nighttime activities. Um, so I asked my evening person if she would start putting together a video game night. Um, it was a really good success. We had a lot of students um, come in. You'll see some students playing Jackbox in the one picture and somebody running, a, I think it was a Call of Duty tournament in the other picture. Um, but what came about as I was putting this together and as we were doing um, like an assessment of the program to make sure that uh, we wanted, if we wanted to do it again, the daytime person felt really out of the loop. Um, I you know, communicated mostly with the evening person. Um, the evening person went to the dorms, they um, put up flyers, they posted flyers, sent emails to the student list, and the daytime person was kind of out of the loop. Um, she let it be known a little bit later. Um, and I will fully admit some of that was my own personal bias and I had some biases. Um, my evening person was in her mid-20s. Um, my daytime person was in her early 70s. I assumed um, that she wouldn't want to program a video game night or stay up till you know midnight on a Friday night. <clears throat> what came about after, um, you'll see I, I say I had three individuals instead of a team, um, after we had our program and some of these feelings started coming out about feeling out of the loop and being um, you know undervalued was that instead of working as a team it seemed like we were working as three individuals. And then I say gathering allies. What I mean by that was because there was uh, some resentment with the staff, the daytime staff people, um, staff person kind of reached out to daytime staff on the campus to kind of like vent their frustrations. The evening person did the same, vented the, her frustrations with the evening staff people. And it became um, kind of an awkward, intense situation. And I'll talk a little bit later at the very end about how we ended up resolving it. Um, and really what it boiled down to, there was a, a real lack of awareness on my part. I didn't know that there was resentment until it kind of boiled up and boiled over. Um, my daytime person felt undervalued because I didn't utilize her for the programming. Um, my evening person felt underappreciated because she wasn't getting praise for putting on a great uh, project um, because there was some resentment. I, I appreciated it, but um, she wasn't getting appreciation from the full staff. And really what it all boiled down to was a failure of leadership, I'll fully admit, and I'm trying to do better as my got a new new slate um, as both of those people moved on to other positions or retired and I got a new library under me at Bradford. So that's what the remainder of the presentation will be about, is becoming a better leader. So what I've done um, throughout that process, as I was hearing that things were boiling over um, and we started to confront some of the issues that um, arose um, because people were feeling undervalued and underappreciated. Um, I started doing some of my own research, reading books about conflict management, conflict resolution. Um, I'll share the one that helped me the most. Um, there's an updated one from 2020, I think, in my re references slide. I also met with a few of the HR professionals here at the University of Pittsburgh. They did some coaching for me to uh, see how I could uh, discuss problems with my staff to make sure that things don't boil over in the future. So I boiled it down to basically four main points that I was um, trying to be better, become better at. So self-awareness, um, both for myself as a leader, and then also try to teach my staff to be self-aware um, of the things that are around them. Um, communication, obviously, is the biggest one. I think if I would have communicated better from the get-go on that first uh, conflict, uh, we probably could have nipped it in the bud right away. Teamwork, rather than um, silos, if, if we would have worked as a team right from the get-go. Um, things would have been a little more successful and there wouldn't be quite as much tension. And then confronting the conflict, that's always the hardest part. And I have um, a little slide at the end um, about how we might confront conflict and how we might um, discuss things civilly and um, without judgment and emotion. So we'll go through. 
So I titled these next uh, round of slides, Avoid Making the Same Mistake Twice. This is, like I said, I kind of have a, a clean slate now at my libraries, so I'm trying to do better. Um, I'm trying to notice things around. So my first point that I wanted to make was self-awareness. Um, again, it's so much more than just understanding yourself. Um, of course, self-awareness is uh, self-explanatory, but it also is understanding others and understanding how you are perceived by others. So um, you might, whenever you become self-aware, um, you might be able to put yourself into other shoes and see how they see you. So to that end, what we did um, as another team building exercise, and I'll talk a little bit about team building in a few slides, um, at my weekly Friday meetings that I have with my staff, um, Every once in a while, we'll do kind of like a lunch and learn presentation. So the first one we did, and we actually just did it in January, I think after we came back from winter recess, was to discuss the social style of communication. Um, and this was a really great presentation and a really great um, opportunity for the staff. Um, we all got together. I talked a little bit about some of the research I did on the social style of communication, um, put together a... Um, a quiz for them to take and then we also were able to get a webinar that our um, kind of our professional development health and wellness people put together about um, social style so we watched that webinar together and then discussed it and what was really great about it is you'll see I kind of broke it down into the four um, four styles that are most prevalent um, analytical driving amiable and expressive um, as people were talking, as we were discussing, um, I could see people said, oh, I can understand that I'm a, I'm a driving expressive and um, my coworker is analytical. So even though I like to jump on things, I like to jump on tasks um, and get them done. My analytical coworker likes to think things through, really uh, um, figure out the problem, think all the solutions before acting. And so right away they could tell each other and themselves in um, the social style. So I thought that was really great. Um, also on top of being self-aware uh, and understanding others, is understand that there's cultural differences. Um, we might have a staff person that really comes from like a pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, um, you know, family lifestyle. Um, we might have somebody that is, you know, no nonsense, uh, wants to answer questions right away. Others that might want to um, ask permission to do things. So there's, you know, cultural differences. The way people were raised definitely um, changes how they um, are perceived by others and how they perceive others as well. And of course, and I'll get into it even more with the next slide, communication differences. We learned that as we were doing the uh, social style of communication. Um, some people may, like I mentioned, want that, you know, in your face kind of, you know, rapid fire talking and answer, question and answer. Some people might want to think about things through and then there's a mixture of other things. So understanding that before it boils over is a really great thing. Uh -oh. Avoid making the same mistake twice, communication. So really what I'm doing at um, my Bradford and Titusville team is really breaking down silos. I don't want any more um, people to think that I'm leaving them behind in my discussions. So there's a constant flow of information. Um, we have a Microsoft team channel called the uh, Bradford and Titusville team. We have an email distribution list for the campuses um, that I can reach out to um, both groups and send one message to everybody. Um, we have weekly full staff meetings. So all of the, the Titusville and Bradford folks get together um, on Teams or Zoom, depending on what we're using and get together and talk about things. But I also offer weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings. So if there's something that's uncomfortable that somebody doesn't want to talk about in the group, they can approach me one on one. Um, even though I'm remote for most of my staff, I have an open door policy, but I also go the other way. And because I'm open door, I'd like people to approach me. Um, if they have a problem, I really ask that they come see me um, so that we might be able to talk about it. Um, some caveats to communication and all of this information flow. Um, one thing uh, that I've learned is that face to face is preferable. Um, so even though um, it does take up time. A lot of us have a lot of meetings that we're in all the time. Um, having a face-to-face -face meeting seems to be better um, with a camera on, especially since I'm remote. Um, but uh, sometimes 
uh, uh, face to face meeting might do better as an email. So I have to keep that in mind as a manager um, that sometimes if I just have a quick bulleted list, I can send that out rather than having a big meeting. But if it's something kind of intense, intensive, uh, where somebody might be feeling uncomfortable, they probably wouldn't want to put that in an email. But something to think about as you're developing your communication styles. Um, communication is much more than just text. Um, I think. Uh, going back to self-awareness, uh, how you write your text, um, how you uh, speak, you know, your tone is really important to uh, understand how others hear your tone. You know, if there might be a, a short answer, um, a yes, no answer kind of thing, and some people might be offended by that and think that you're being short with them, but others might say that that's just all the information that's needed. So um, be careful whenever you're um, emailing folks, uh, think about how your answer will be perceived. Um, again, some more caveats. There could be a pushback to the amount of emails. So far, I haven't really had that issue uh, or nobody's mentioned that to me. Um, I think having something in writing that we can go back to is always uh, helpful, especially if it's just like a decision or a programming idea, something like that. Um, I know if it's something sensitive, we should do it in person, but um, that hasn't been an issue. And then very similar to the perception um, and self um self-awareness, interpersonal communication. Um, there's always interpersonal communication differences. Um, so again, if somebody has a tone in their voice, somebody might be offended by it. Um, if somebody's short with an answer, it could cause trouble. So just be aware of those things as a leader and as a staff person if you're in one of these situations. Um, team building. Um, Something again, I'm really trying hard to do is uh, there is an inherent at, at, at the university level and in our library, there is an inherent difference between faculty librarians and staff, but I really try not to uh, go any further than that other than the job titles. Um, rather than saying that we have four librarians and three staff, I really like to say that we have seven members of the Titusville and Bradford team. We all have a shared mission. We all have a mission to help the students, staff and faculties at our campuses. And eventually after COVID restrictions, uh, kind of loosen our greater communities and be able to get out there. So we all, if we all have that shared mission and we're all pushing forward to it, it should really help um, and make the team stronger. Um, to that end, also for team building, uh, we try to do small internal programming that might promote teamwork. So one Friday a month or so, um, we started something called Fun Fridays. This was something that was done by the previous director pre-COVID, whenever people were in the library full time. Um, so about three years or so ago, they did Fun Fridays. And what that uh, is, is one Friday a month, um, somebody that has a special talent or a special skill can bring in something and share it with the whole group. So um, if somebody knows about quilting or sewing, they can do, they can bring in a little sample and um, if they have enough supplies, they can share it with others to you know, demonstrate. Um, I think what I'll demonstrate is like an Excel spreadsheet. I'm not as exciting as other people, but how to use Excel properly or how to set up folders in Outlook. Um, and also team building, and I'll talk about this a little bit in my collaborate, uh, celebration of successes, uh, creating some kind of external programming that allows individual talents to sh shine. So uh, low level, low stakes programming that allows input for all people. So a lot of times our uh, library programs are uh, generated by librarians, the faculty librarians. But if there's an event that you can come up with that helps bring everyone together um, to get, get input, um, if they have special talents, again, if they can craft something that might hang up in the library for a program or an event, that would be really great um, and really helps build teams. <clears throat> Probably the most difficult thing is confronting the conflict. Um, this has always been the most difficult for me. Um, I see that I'm going a little over, so I'm going to go fast. Um, yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say, yeah, anyone who's joining us for our afternoon sessions, we're just wrapping up our lightning round. So um, feel free, listen in here um, about, we're talking about confronting conflict with our staff. And we'll be starting with our afternoon sessions in just a minute here. Thank you, I got two more slides, so I'll be done soon. Um, it's the most difficult aspect for me as, as an introverted librarian. I think there's probably a lot of people like me in libraries. Um, so what I try to do is think of the best way to um, talk talk to my staff. Uh, do we wanna confront? Probably confrontation is probably the worst to jump right at somebody. And avoidance is probably the second worst. It's probably not gonna go on it, away on its own. What I've had success um, with my Titusville folks, um, whenever we had some uh, conflict was compromising and discussions one-on-one -on -one. Um, and then that kind of evolved after people got 
comfortable talking to me one on one, uh, I could act as a mediator um, between my two staff because at the time I only had two staff members and myself. So I had to be the mediator um, um, uh, between them. And um, it seemed to really work to get them to feel comfortable talking to each other and then talking to me about their problems um, and knowing that they could feel comfortable doing that. When talking, civility is the most important thing. Uh, make sure that people, um, uh, and yourself as a leader might have empathy, humility, and compassion. Understand um, that others feel different um, depending on their backgrounds and their, uh, you know, the culture that they were raised in. Um, but honesty, don't have civility over honesty. Honesty is the most important thing. If we brush it aside and avoid it, um, the, com the conflict's not going to go away. Um, but in that honesty, make sure that you're non-judgmental. And really push, I got this from some of the HR professionals I saw and some of the books I read, really push, it's the behavior that's being confronted, not the person. So if there um, is some, uh, you know, gossip um, or um, somebody's talking out of turn, um, it's that behavior. It's not the person that you're confronting. You want to stop that behavior. And, that, uh, you know, be aware that emotions are going to uh, be harsh. You know, there's going to be a lot of emotion in these discussions. So be aware of that. Um, whenever you're communicating, very similar, If um, depending on if you're doing email or face-to-face, -face, be aware of your tone. Uh, for these sorts of things, you'd probably want to do a face-to-face. And then really, as a leader, really have uh, self-awareness. Put yourselves into other people's shoes. Uh, understand their cultural differences. A lot of the co conflict really boils down to communication and self-awareness. Um, and really celebrate success. That's what I had at Titusville um, and what we've uh, had a few successes at Bradford um, for low stakes things. Um, low stake work tasks, uh, what I did with my Titusville folks, uh, because there was two of them, um, I had them after they felt comfortable t talking to me about the issues they had with each other and with the way I managed them. I had uh, low stake work tasks so i did book displays had them come up with book displays together so they'd be pulling books off the shelves together and be comfortable working together periodical cleanup it's a, we have a very small periodical collection but it, you know it was needs to be weeded every once in a while um after five years or so um so we had some book uh, journals that needed to be cleaned up and some records that needed to be cleaned up where they had to work sort of close but not you know right next to each other and our uh, small archive um cleanup um just organizing it and then some fun events. What really broke the ice at Titusville is when we did an edible cake contest for banned books. Um, you see a couple that I posted there um, that helped get, you know, as people were coming up with ideas or my staff people were coming up with ideas for what books they wanted to do and how they might uh, bake their cakes. You know, it really got the laughter going. It got people feeling comfortable. Um, and then uh, we did a, an escape room or a, it was like a Harry Potter themed escape room night. Um, at my library. And then at Bradford, what we did is a, a low stakes fun event that highlighted everybody's skills was a haunted library tour where some staff members um, yeah, crafted snakes and uh, spiders and some uh, staff people wandered around and laughed like a witch. Um, so it really allowed people to get out of their comfort zone, but also uh, their own talents to shine through and help build teamwork. Um, so here's my references. I did want to point out uh, this um, cultivating civility, practical ways to improve a dysfunctional library was super helpful. Um, it's really easy read, um, really points out a lot about self-awareness and communication. Um, so yeah. So. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. That was, I think, very helpful. I know, as, uh, you, as you said in your description, this is something small libraries, small groups of people working very closely together, conflict can, you know, so much about each other, but you know so little sometimes. Thank at you. At the same time, yeah. Um, reach out to Mark if you do have any questions. There's his email address right there on his slides, and all the slides and references and all this will be available in the recordings afterwards. So don't try and scribble down all these book titles. <laughs> Here, um, you'll have access to all of this um, with a recording um, when I get those up in a bit. Awesome. So thank you very much. Thank we you.